Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming to today's speaker event. Uh, my name is Nam Shikyu, and I will be your moderator for today's event. I hope everyone here in attendance is doing well despite the ongoing pandemic. Uh, I know that the majority here in attendance are college students, and for a college student, college event like this, uh, it will definitely be ideal to meet in person, interact, but I think we can still create that kind of campus environment here on Zoom uh, by seeing everyone's faces. So if you can, I want to ask everyone to turn on their cameras so that we can all see each other. Uh, that way we can create a more intimate setting here on Zoom. Um, but if you really don't want to show your faces or your webcams are broken, that is totally fine as well. Um, to give a quick rundown of today's speaker event, uh, we'll first have some opening remarks, uh, then the main speech from our speaker, Mr. Hyunsung Lee, followed by a Q&A session where the audience can directly ask questions to the speaker, and then we will close with a group photo. So welcome everyone to today's speaker event, A Ripple of Change, The Journey of Hyunsung Lee's Escape from North Korea. To give a brief introduction of myself and how this event was organized, I graduated last year out of UCLA class of 2020, and throughout my four years as an undergrad, I was an active member of the Liberty in North Korea chapter on campus. And during that time, I learned about the human rights crisis taking place in North Korea, especially from listening to the testimonies given by actual North Korean defectors that visited our campus. And after graduating, I wanted to continue working in this area, particularly through promoting this idea of Korean unification. And that's when I came across Alliance for Korea United USA, which is a coalition of Korean American organizations and individuals advancing the cause for a unified Korea. Um, so through forums, education programs, policy initiatives, and community engagement projects, AKU USA works to build consensus and momentum toward a unified Korea and also strengthening the longstanding alliance between the US and ROK. So as a volunteer for AKU USA, I wanted to contribute by finding a way to engage more youth in this work, especially since it is the young people that serve as the backbone of any kind of grassroots movement. So naturally I thought, why not reach out to my friends from Link at UCLA and try to organize a speaker event that touches upon the human rights issue in North Korea, as well as this idea of unifying the Korean homeland as a long-term solution. So that's how this event came about. And I want to truly thank the two co-organizers, AKUSA and Link at UCLA for putting this together. Um, I will now have the co-presidents of Liberty in North Korea at UCLA give a few remarks on the work that they have been doing this past school year. So let's welcome up Joy Yoon and Rebecca Park. Thank you, Nam, um, for the introduction. Hi, my name is Rebecca Park, and I am one of your co-presidents for UCLA um, Link. Hi, my name is Joy, and I am the other co-president. Yeah. And before we start, um, before we listen to Hyun Sung Lee, uh, we would just like to introduce Link. So I'll quickly share my screen. Um, so yeah, this is uh, Liberty in North Korea at UCLA, and um, we're just gonna talk briefly about what LINK is, then the goals of LINK um, as a rescue team, what type of events we have, and how you can get involved. Um, so LINK's broad mission um, is to help with the rescue and resettlement of North Korean defectors, and this takes approximately uh, 3,000 3, miles, um, as well as $3,000, uh, respectively. And um, so far, LINK has done the great work of rescuing um, 1,201 individuals from North Korea, um, but the work is still not over. And so that is where our team comes in um, to advocate for the North Korean people. All right, so these are our three main goals here at Liberty North Korea UCLA. Number one is, of course, raising awareness um, about the challenges that the people face within North Korea, as well as um, during the defection process and resettling in South Korea. And we do this through speaker events like today's event, um, through different discussions in our general meetings, as well as spreading information on our social media. 
And number two is fundraising. Um, our goal is this year is $3,500, which contributes to helping one defector come from China to South Korea. And number three is, of course, community building. Um, we really believe that we need a strong foundation to advocate for a cause. And so we really try to foster that type of community building in our club, as well as just making friends and having that social support group in college. So here are just a few of our highlights from this year. Number one, um, we collaborated with Sejui, which um, provides mental health services to defectors in South Korea. And so we were able to hear um, a defector's story and her challenges with mental health in South Korea, and as well as have a small distress activity at the end. Number two is our fundraising. Um, our, one of our most successful was our Halloween grams. We stole like little plushies and Muji pens, which is everyone's favorite. Um, this year we've raised $2,254, but we do have a couple hundred dollars left um, to reach our goal of $3,500. And finally, once again, community building. Um, we had a lot of socials this year, ranging from um, origami nights, um, face masks, um, movie nights, game nights. And my favorite was definitely our Christmas social where we did Secret Santa through Amazon gifts. Okay. So lastly, to get involved or to get connected with our team, um, if you would like to be updated on just upcoming events and what we have, um, please follow us on our Instagram at linkucla. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, specific questions, then please reach out to us um, through our email. And like Joyce said, we have raised uh, $3,254 so far. So we're really, really close to our 3,500 goal. So if you'd like to contribute to that, um, please feel free to donate any amount directly to our team page, um, which will be linked in the chat, um, or you can Venmo us at link UCLA. And um, that is all for our pres presentation. Um, thank you for listening. And we'll pass it off to Nong to introduce our main speaker for tonight. All right, thank you so much, Joy and Rebecca for that nice presentation. Um, I think that despite the challenges of the pandemic and everything transitioning to online, it's amazing how much you guys were still able to you know, accomplish this school year. And um, it's also nice to see a lot of familiar faces from the Link UCLA Executive Board here today. Um, and so as Joy said, to find out more about Link UCLA's work and how to get involved, how to donate, please check out their social media links uh, and donation link that is posted below in the chat. Um, I know that you guys have already past the $3,000 threshold, which is the amount to save one North Korean refugee. And so that's really amazing. So if you guys can support them to reach their, uh, this year's school goal, uh, which is 3,500, that'll be greatly appreciated. So next up, I would like to now introduce the main speaker for today's event. Uh, Hyunsung Lee is a highly sought after consultant specialized in North Korea affairs for a variety of think tanks and NGOs in the Washington DC area. As a son of a high ranking official, Hunting was raised in an elite environment with the most prestigious opportunities available in North Korean society. He worked in DPRK China business relations as deputy general manager at Korea Miang Shipping Corporation. But with the start of a series of brutal purges by Kim Jong-un, he and his family defected back in 2014 and they are now settled here in the United States. So let's welcome up Hyunsung Lee. Hello everyone, my name is Hyunsung Lee. Thank you for having me. I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to all of you here. It's my great honor to introduce myself to you today. Um, before starting conversation, I'd like to explain the reason I defected. So six years ago, on October 5th, 2015, my family and I made a significant decision in our lifetime. We left our beloved country in search for freedom. Escaping from North Korea for asylum itself was a very shocking decision for my family because decision, a defection is like giving up everything behind in North Korea. For example, life and relatives and friends and memories. My mother said on the day of defection, when I heard about other people's defection story, I thought, how could they leave their hometown? But I never 
dream that the day would come when I have make such a decision. Prior to uh, the faction, my father worked for North Korea's uh, economic advisor to the Workers' Party uh, in China. So my family was living in Dalian city in China and being together in China was a huge opportunity for us to defect and we could flee to South Korea safely. Um, in the process of defect, uh, there is a help for South Korean government and then it was uh, very helpful and um, we can safely land in South Korea. But uh, just a year later, we could uh, come to United States to seek more opportunity here. And I, I'd like to explain the main reason my family defected. The reason is because Kim Jong-un's indiscriminated push and execution. Starting with the execution of his uncle, Chang Song Tech's associates in November 2014, he purged about 500 elites and almost uh, 20 hundreds, uh, 20 thousand, their family, put 20 thousand, their families to the public prison camps. Literally every day, there was a news and information that someone had been purged when I was in North Korea. What I still vividly remember is the whole execution process, the senior military official who participated in the public execution of uh, Chang Sung Tech's two close associates told us um, after the three, uh, execution of three days, he explained the whole scene and then it started like, uh, the, like more than hundreds officials you know, um, put the bus together and they sent, they went to uh, public executions place. It was the, like a military academy and there was a two people on the stage tied with the rope and then, you know, blanket. And then they soon after they find out that um, there are the people who will be executed. And there was a sound like you know, voice of the North Korean official that um, like shit against the traders. And then, you know, those anti profit guns flamed, you know, and then the whole body, the anti craft gun is, you know, literally anti uh, craft. I mean, the airplane. So the blades are very huge. And then the body was scattered immediately. And then the whole body was scattered. And then um, some soldiers, they took a flame projector and then they burned it with the body. And then the remains in the, on the ground and then there was an announcement that these bastards are not deserved to bury it in the sacred land. And then they put the tanks there and then smashed it, crushed it. And then the execution, whole execution ends. So he explained the whole scene during the dinner with my family and then nobody could eat the, any food that day. So we just left and then I mean, every family, members of my family were shot. And during these executions, I lost two friends too, a person of my friends. One friend was executed because his father-in-law was close associate of Kim Jong-un's uncle, Chang Sung Tae. And the other one was uh, sent to the political prison camp with his entire family because his grandfather was the top associates of Kim Jong-un's and Kim Gyeong-hee. Through ex experiencing through this, uh, you know, close friends being executed and so political prison camp, we raised the fundamental question that, I mean, what this country is about? What are these, you know, what is the leader is doing for its, uh, to its people? And later, my sister was shocked when she saw her roommate being escorted from a Chinese university dormitory by the North Korean agents. 
literally the North Korean agent come to the uh, Chinese university. Obviously she was a North Korean girl and she, they took her in front of my sister. And then you know, the girl you know, sent the last text message to my sister that, hey, could you pack my things to send to my home in North Korea? And then uh, my sister packed things and then sent the uh, um, things to home. And then we couldn't find her family, entire family and gone. And we never reached out again. So experiencing such brutal purges, my family was angry with the regime and then thought that such a regime had lost its cause and value to exist any longer. So that's the main reason we left North Korea and we uh, believe it's the right decision to make. And uh, there's a two uh, big ex um, in, at events to change my perspective and then life. So one was my military life in North Korea and another life is my study in China. So briefly, I wanna explain my military life in North Korea. So as soon as I graduate high school, I joined the military, but my high school was like a top school in North Korea. So I was examined the military service, but I voluntarily joined the North Korean military and I served three, and, three years and three months. So all, I, sometimes I felt like oh, I made the wrong decision because all my schoolmates were exempt from the military service, they promoted the university and then they, you know, they had a better in a time than me, and then I was just uh, uh, frustrated sometimes. But you know, after the military service, I think it is the best decision I made because I can understand the North Korean society better. And then a lot of experience I've been experienced in the military was not is very uh, exceptional experience than others. So. Uh, among those experiences, I just wanna share one shocking experience that I never forget. So the first day of arriving training camp, I found that there was a 10 uh, senior members like who had served like in one or two years more than me. And then they were very thin and looked so lethargic. But uh, what was shocking was that they all had two fingers missing. So it's not accidentally missing. And I asked my senior member, one of the high senior member that, so what, what happened to them? And then he just, you know, he talked to me that those, you know, people, those like soldiers cannot bear their military life. So they cut their fingers by themselves. So in North Korean military, there was a rule that if you lost the two, um, fingers or like the, the, uh, the main finger to shoot the gun, if you're unable to shoot the gun properly and then uh, you could be discharged from the military. And then I think they cut their fingers by themselves because uh, the military life was really tough. And then it is like not just uh, one side is tough. There is a like mentally tough and then, you know, uh, the food quality is not good. And there was a like a beating and then abuses from the senior members. So some of the uh, soldiers, they can just bear, cannot bear it. And I, I, and I heard some of them make committed suicide and then some of, some of them really mad. And then, you know, they bring the gun night and then they shut the whole unit during the night. But um, so, you know, North Korean military is, very tough compared to South Korean military and the US military. I know US military is, is training very hard and then they all have fancy food and the equipments. But uh, compared to North Korean military, I think uh, it is still better quality, uh, you know, environment than North Korea. So most of North Korean military had three meals, uh, but uh, like before 2000, when you know South Korean president Kim Jong Kim Dae Jung, you know, bring 500 million to North Korean uh, leader Kim Jong Il, uh, and then massive food aid to North Korea, they only ate two meals a day, and um, 
So that's why North Korean soldiers, when, no, when you guys look at North Korean soldiers, they're very look thin and then, you know, very short. It's because of malnutrition. So um, I can explain the, the food quality of North Korean soldiers. So the food every day they eat is, uh, you know, 70% of corn and then 30% of rice mixed one bowl of rice. And then there was a like soup. It is a uh, soybean soup, but it tastes like really salt soup. And another, you know, small dishes. I, I would say uh, three pieces of radish and like uh, three pieces of, you know, cabbage. And then it is all uh, marinated with the salt. So there's basically no test. And then every day I have to eat. So I had, I ate this uh, food like more than two years. So, I mean, those two things are very, you know, vivid memory of my life. I couldn't forget because it was never experienced before. And then I, I think I couldn't experience before. And uh, before I, people talk, I, I experienced my elementary life. I told you guys that I have a two uh, events that changed my life. Is One is military and then another is life in China. And I was lucky because uh, obviously my dad served a high ranking position. And then, so after discharging from the military, I uh, was I able to join the North Korea Workers Party at my 20 years old age. And it is not for everyone because um, if becoming North Korean member, uh, member of North Korean Workers Party is kind of high privilege for young people. And then later I discharged from the military and then I went to China to study. So, and the life in China was very critical time for me to change my perception and you know, worldview. Um, but in the first few years, I didn't try to see social problems of North Korea or had doubts about the region because, you know, um, you know North Korea's education and then I, North Korea's education that I should not have, you know, fantasies about capitalism. However, uh, China's development and the access to South Korean news and the internet and interact with, interact with South Korean students and Chinese people, like, changed my perception gradually. So after three years, I think I, uh, most of my perception changed. And the first thing I felt fresh in college was the students enrolled for the course they wanted to take. And then it was shocking to me because in North Korea, all courses at university are decided by the government and you cannot choose any subjects you want. Obviously you can, uh, you can choose your major, but it's not, I don't think it's, you can choose. It, it is also uh, chosen by the government. So, you know, by enrolling the first year course, one cr question came across my mind that why do North Korean students have no freedom to choose the course they want to take? And probably most North Korean students who have never studied abroad will not even have a such question because they don't even know if such an enrollment system exists. Assessing to, uh, accessing to South Korean news and I have learned how the world views our country. And then I learned that propaganda in North Korea is total fake. North Korea still boasts that uh, it is the, North Korea is the best socialist country in the world. And that its leader is the greatest leader in the world. They never tell us the truth outside the world. In fact, while I was in China, many North Korean officials and the list who experienced China for the first time and was shocked by the Chinese development and expressed disappointment at the regime. South Korean news has become a daily routine for uh, North Korean businessmen and then the travelers to China and representative in North Korea, in foreign countries. The TV channels that the business travelers watch the Chinese hotel were CNN and Korea, no, South Korea's K KBS. It's also especially for young people, Korean movies and news 
are essential. Um, in 2007, I went to an internet, you know, cafe in Dandong, like basically everybody can you know, play internet games in one places. There was uh, in China, so I, I went to there to meet my friends. And then I found that there are about 20 North Korean students in one internet cafe. And then they are all watching South Korean new episode of a drama, new episode. So I was very shocked that um, I never experienced this situation before because um, usually if somebody watches South Korean dramas and then there is somebody who reports to the government, but you know, Imagine the Chinese students, they get together watching one uh, South Korean drama. And then I think it's a huge develop for, development for young people's mind. And, you know, if they were like in North Korea, they would be held in political prison camps. So North Korea's sharing of information is now an unstoppable trend, I guess. Uh, I think um, most information, even though it's a drama or like a small information can change their perception. And uh, during this college, I played a uh, soccer game and then play other board games with South Korean students a lot. And there are some Japanese students, uh, by the way, and then they recommend a good Japanese animation as well. So while interacting with them uh, without monitoring by the regime, I realized that they are not my enemies, that I was educated in North Korea and then, you know, North Korean school and military, and, uh, but they're friends. Since I was young, I was taught that Japan, I mean, Japan is like North Korea's 100 year enemy and the South Korea as a people, we should liberate from the imperialism of the United States. Even in the military, I was instructed that in case of war, the South Korean civilians who oppose the North Korean regime should be killed. Through interaction with them, I felt that the anti-Japanese and anti-Korean and anti-American education of the North Korean regime was totally wrong and the people of two Korea could easily unify if there is no uh, government interception. Um, and then I, I'd like to explain some uh, points that how North Korean regime controlled the information inside North Korea. So there are some information on online how Kim regime block access information and strengthen punishment using various means. But I'd like to share several uh, examples that my friends experienced in North Korea. So in 2003, nearly 200 students of uh, North Korea Kim Il-sung University and Pyongyang University of Foreign Studies, which are top schools in North Korea, uh, were detained in prison, like 200 students were detained in prison. They were merely imprisoned for watching and sharing American and South Korean movies. At first, uh, several students were detained and beaten like because of their watching South Korean dramas. But soon after, about 200 students were arrested. What is surprising here is the police beat and imprisoned the students until they call out the names of friends who share the information. So they released only the student who released, who, re who revealed his friend's name from the prison. Eventually, 200 students were detained, but the regime, uh, they couldn't punish them all because they will realize that all of the students are elite class, uh, children of elite class. So the regime sent only two uh, senior students to a political prison camp with their entire family, but also three of my schoolmates were subject to six months forced labor in the labor camp. And I met them up to six months later and then they cried a lot because they never experienced that hardship before. And then, um, you know, they, you know, literally told me they won't watch again the South Korean and American dramas. But um, unfortunately, one year later, they uh, 
watch the Tuscan drama and then Omega movies again. I mean, I would say, as long as people are seeking information and freedom, and I don't think it, nobody can stop it. Um, and I have another example that like in old 2000, I think it's very interesting to you guys in North Korea, there was a chatting like application like MSN Messenger using North Korean intranet was popular among North Korean college students. So the chat messenger spread in college students to the point where they said it was a sensational and students were using this chatting platform to um, communicate and network with students from other schools. In 2005, uh, my schoolmates suggested basketball game to college students through the messenger and surprisingly about 100 students from various universities scattered near Pyongyang gymnasium. They enjoyed a basketball game very much. However, three days after the game, the chat, uh, the chat platform server was permanently shut down because the regime believed that the chat platform could be used as a tool against the regime instead of thinking that platform was uh, served for students networking each other with pleasure. Uh, this is because the regime never imagined that, that so many people would gather in one place organized by you know, purely citizens themselves, other than the gathering organized by the regime. Like this, to maintain uh, its power, the Kim regime had been conducting extreme information control that prevents not only us, I mean, inflow information, uh, only the inflow of the information, but also internal communication within its citizens inside the country. And uh, in North Korea, most of the foreign contents are unauthorized information, except for a few approved by the Kim regime. Despite the Kim's extreme control of information access, the North Koreans' desire to seek information is unstoppable. I would say almost all North Koreans have seen foreign content at least once. Because uh, when I have a private conversation with my military colleagues, schoolmates, and the coworkers, there's no one who didn't see foreign movies, and then there uh, was no one who saw them only once. To characterize its generation, the younger generation mainly watched and read cultural education and technology content. Meanwhile, the older generation is seeking mainly, mainly seek thoughts outside the news and information on how the world views North Korea. And when I was in North Korea, the most foreign content I watched were holy movies and American music videos. So there are several uh, foreign movies I liked when I was in North Korea. It's like, um, I like 007 series and Titanic and Pearl Harbor. And the first American music video uh, I saw, I still remember because my close friend brought those music videos from uh, Southeast of America, South America, because his family uh, stayed uh, South America for seven years for North Korea's representative. The music video was like uh, Backstreet Boys and Britney Spears music video. and. Uh, at, at the beginning, we were shocked and then, you know, their dress and then their dancing and then, you know, um, like their, the way they, you know, act in the music video and then it was like really new world to us. And I think we like, you know, reason, reason and I mean, repeated like almost more than 10 times at once. And, you know, this, so we copied CDs and then, you know, um, I think at the time, like a tape and a record tape and then CD. So we uh, duplicated many CDs and circulated before. And yeah, it was very good experience. And then I think uh, I still remember the song names and the lyrics. So it was really uh, interesting to me. And, but uh, later, um, Almost after 2000, the South Korean content become more popular. I would like to share a very interesting example how South Korean, how North Koreans change their perspective after they watch the foreign content. 
So before I defect North Korea, I visited my friend's house in Pyongyang 2014. Uh, he was one of the keen family members, and I found out that he was watching a recent released South Korean drama with his friends. And then I questioned him that, why do you watch South Korean dramas, even though you know it could, be co it could cause a big problem for you? And then, but interestingly, he uh, refused to answer instead, uh, refused to answer, but uh, uh, posed me a question. Why do North Koreans live poorer than South Koreans? Why has the same socialist country, China, developed so much, but not North Korea? And then when we can spend money as much as South Koreans? And I literally speechless. And then I want to, you know, I won't answer that question, but um, I couldn't. But I know the answer at the time because I want to tell him that because of your family, because he's part of the Kim family, but I couldn't say that. So, because if I said it, I obviously could be in jail. Um, so, you know, but I still believe his question is very good example how people who have seen foreign content change their views towards North Korean society. I think it's, I mean, it's time we should give him an answer. And um, lastly, I guess, um, obviously I wanna answer more questions, answer more um, my question, my answers to your questions. But uh, before I go, I wanna uh, talk, uh, ask you one thing. So after this event, I hope you guys raise your voice for North Korean people's human rights because uh, some people in, um, just give me a second. So many people like in South Korea, like current administration and his advisors, they raise voice that North Korean human, we shouldn't boy, make a voice for North Korean human rights because it provokes North Korean regime. But I strongly disagree with their perspective and comments because I mean, if we don't make voice for human rights, then it probably Kim Jong-un regime's human rights violations will be justified and uh, will be, I mean, justified day by day. And then later, nobody question, question of Kim Jong-un regime's human rights violations. And then it makes Kim Jong-un regime legitimate and justified. I don't think it's a good strategy. I don't think it's a good um, agenda for them. And I have to make this public because I hope you understand many people think about why don't we make like a peace treaty with North Korean regime? And if we, why don't we just you know sit down and then have a talk with North Korean regime? And if we understand North Korean regime correctly, the, the regime cannot simply sit down and make a peace treaty with the United States and South Korea because the regime committed against the uh, crime against the humanity for 70 years. Once they, the society is open to public and the regime cannot to survive. That's why Kim Jong-un kept North Korea isolated. And then that's why Kim Jong-un put 200,000 people in political prison camp still in this now, so un until now. So I think if we have to question that will Kim Jong-un give up his nuclear weapons and improve human rights of North Korea if the US does not have a voice in North Korean human rights? And does the resolution of North Korea nuclear issue guarantee freedom and human rights of North Koreans? And can North Koreans travel freely to South Korea if we sign the peace treaty, I think we have to answer this fundamental question, frankly, on our own. Um, for us, like North Korean people, the North Korean issue is not a matter that the US or South Korea can make a concession through negotiations. It is a matter of freedom, human rights, and the life of people. 
in North Korea. I mean, those rights are inalienable rights for us. And then I hope uh, President Biden and then you know South Korean president view North Korean issue as a freedom, human rights, and life of people living in North, not just the Kim Jong Un and democratization. Also, I sincerely hope for two president and all of you guys one day in the future will be able to say that we did the right thing for 25 million people in North Korea who have the same human rights as we, as rest of us. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Hansing, for sharing your personal story and insight on North Korea, as well as how we can move forward to change the current reality on the Korean Peninsula. I think that um, a lot of people tend to blame the elite class along with the Kim regime for the problems that exist in North Korea. But you and your family's decision to actually defect really breaks that kind of stereotype and perception that the North Korean elite fully support Kim Jong-un and what want to sustain the dictatorship where in reality, they do not have any freedom as well. And they are also living in fear of being the next ones uh, to be put in jail or be persecuted. So thank you once again, Hansen, for that amazing uh, speech. We will now open the floor to questions that the audience can directly ask to Hansen. Um, so if you would like to ask a question, uh, you can simply click on the reactions tab down below and then click on raise hand. And then I will then call on you. Um, if you would like to type your question in the chat box, you may do that as well. And I can read off the questions from there. So I would like to now ask the audience who would like to ask the first question. All right, so I see a hand raised from Allison. Uh, Allison, if you can unmute yourself and ask your question to Hansen. Hi, uh, thank you. First of all, thank you so much for uh, meeting with us here today and taking the time to share with us your experience. Uh, this has really been really eye opening for me, um, being kind of somebody that has um, kind of learned, uh, has been actively learning about the uh, narrative of uh, refugees for the past few years. Uh, this has been really very educational. Um, my question for you um, is with your experience in the military, push your life in China, much of your perception of North Korea regime has shifted quite a bit, um, especially now as someone that has defected from the country and has traveled to many places, notably Washington DC, I heard um, in the beginning with the intro uh, where the US's uh, political hub resides. I assume that your perception continue, uh, continuously changes and shifts. Um, given these experiences and shifts in perception, what is one thing that you would tell your younger self or your past self? Excuse me, can you repeat what last sentence? Can you repeat last sentence? Uh, yes, of course. Um, so given these um, shifts in perception and your experiences, what is one thing that you would tell your younger self or your past self? Um, so, um, I have been, you know, many experience like you know, in China and then South Korea and United States. Obviously, my perception has changed. But the one thing I didn't, I, mean, I haven't changed is the Kim regime has never intended to uh, commit democratization. And then uh, another thing is they never intended to improve the peop uh, life of North Korean people's life because their main focus and the policy main everything is focused on their um, maintaining the regime, especially you know, the ideology and then especially the system of controlling people. So there is a like uh, for a surveillance system, for a uh, four la layer of surveillance system, so, I mean, surveillance system, like monitoring system. And then if you look at the North Korean society closely and then it, you, you will find out that there's literally no freedom. Like, and then the level of freedom, I mean, the limitation of freedom, the, if, if we are elites, then they have more limitation of freedom. But every people think like uh, Nam Shing mentioned, and then um, everybody think that uh, the elite of the 
North Korea is aligned with and on the uh, same boat with Kim Jong Un, but honestly, it's not simply true. And then many of them have changed the perception, and then many of them still, uh, many of them is not loyal to Kim regime. But the reason they still stick with Kim regime is uh, they have to protect their families. And then North Korea is not the country that once we left, and then our families are safe. Our families suffered in North Korea as well. And uh, so it's not easy for everyone to make such a decision, you know, harm to every relatives in North Korea and to, you know, live by yourself. So, but uh, yeah, so I don't know. I mean, I think I'm still have the same feeling that I defected, the day I defected still. So, that's why I'm trying to, you know, make a voice of North Korean human rights and then trying to make advice to the US government that the only solution here in North Korea is to solve North Korean human rights issue. And then, you know, we don't see any development even if we in a crisis in North Korea. All right, thank you so much, Allison, for your thoughtful question and Hyunsung for that response. We have another hand raised by Yushin Tanai. Yushin, please unmute yourself and you can ask your question to Hyunsung. Hi, can you hear me? Okay, hopefully you can hear me. Um, Yushin, your, your uh, volume is a bit low, if you could. Oh, very quiet, okay. Gotcha. Sorry, give me a sec, I'll try and fix that. In the meantime, um, I can read off another question that came in through the chat. This is from uh, Lauren Brown, very interesting question. Do you think President Moon has helped or hindered progress in helping North Korean refugees and reunification? And what are some ways we can help refugees within the US and South Korea? So Hyunsung, if you can respond to that question. Hi, uh, can you hear me, Namsu? Okay. Yes, we can hear you. So thank you, Lauren. Uh, it's a great question. And, you know, I do believe, uh, you know, Moon regime, Moon government, you know, hindered the progress in, you know, improved North Korean human rights because, you know, Moon, Moon Jae-in like is a human rights lawyer and he built a career as a human rights lawyer, but he never talks North Korean human rights in life. Before becoming president, or you know, now he's a president, he never talked about North Korean human rights because he believes that talking about North Korean human rights provokes North Korean regime. So it's hindering negotiation with North Korea. But we have to think about it. Without freedom and human rights, there, I mean, will there be a peace between North and South Korea? What's the point of negotiation and then, you know, um, I mean, what's the point of negotiation between two Koreas? It's eventually, we have to talk for people's life and freedom and human rights. And, and I, I'm very disappointed like Moon Jae-in government and his advisors because their approach is like, you know, as I say earlier, if they don't talk about North Korea human rights violations and then and then eventually we will see the North Korean regime's human rights violations will be legitimized and justified by the international community. If nobody, like for example, if, the, if we didn't highlight the Hitler's, you know, the human rights crime, and then how we could know, how we could know the, the exact, the human rights violations. So we should keep base voices and then actually, uh, Moon, I think uh, Moon Jae-in government's uh, in intervention is uh, hindering the process of unification as well. And right. then, yeah, um, there are several ways we can help North Korean refugees. First of all, I, you know, I think I didn't speak well uh, during my speech. So first of all, I hope you guys make your voice for North Korean human rights. And then I think your voice matters. And then. Uh, you know, even your college time, or you can talk to your legislative uh, branches and your senators and the congressmen and 
And recently I talked with some uh, Park Min Kill members to create North Korea Human Rights, I mean, North Korea Information Act. As you probably know, South Korean government and then South Korean uh, National Assembly adopted anti police law because basically they're sending information, uh, they're blocking sending information into North Korea. But they, they are saying that they want to protect uh, the people of border area because North Korean regime is aggressively acting towards that anti lipolis bill, uh, the lipolis. So they want to protect its people so that they're blocking, uh, legally blocking the lipolis to North Korea. We, but extent of this law, uh, we, we think there is a lot of you know, limitation and then they basically uh, block all information, all money, all goods to send North Korea. So, um, you know, I think your voices matters and that's the way I think uh, you guys can engage more actively. And then another way is uh, helping link and then such as this wonderful group to save uh, people's life. And I recently received message from one of my, uh, not friend, but uh, one person in uh, Russia, like North Korean, he's trying to defect, but there is no way he defect. So he went to uh, Russian UN camp, but he wanted to come, to, he wanted to come to United States, but there was no way he can come to United States uh, because there are so many, you know, uh, fac uh, factors they should consider like, you know, Russia and US diplomatic uh, solution, uh, relationship. And then he's afraid, in, he's afraid to go South Korean embassy to seek help because, you know, South, I mean, South Korean government, they returned to North Korean fishermen last year to North Korea. So many North Korean refugees is, are fearing that uh, whether South Korean government is, you know, put them back to North Korea. So, I, but I think Link is doing a very great job. So I hope you guys support more Link. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Lauren, for that uh, amazing question and Hansung for that response. Uh, if you should, now your audio is working okay, you can unmute yourself and ask Hansung your question. Hopefully it works this time. Can you hear me well? Yeah. Okay, thank you. awesome. Um, yeah, I guess I was just really curious uh, to hear more about your personal experience and understanding of the general attitude of the North Korean elites uh, towards the Kim regime and how that compares as well, I guess, to the attitudes of the everyday citizens, how they view the Kim regime, and also kind of connected to that, what you feel or believe the role of the, Korean, uh, the North Korean citizens are in terms of, I guess, reunification or achieving freedom for the North Korean people. Uh, first of all, regarding your question, I would say the North Korean elites are not always supporting the regime. Uh, since I said earlier, uh, I would say they are very good, you know, actors or actresses to perform that they, you know, like loyal to Kim Jong Un, and then, and then, you know. There's a one way, uh, two way, two reasons they stick with Kim regime. Uh, other one is I told you earlier, like to protect their family. Another one is to make money through, you know, using Kim Jong Un's power. So, um, but I would say their loyalty decreases a lot to Kim Jong Un's constant purge. You know, five uh, 2014 he executed 500 officials and then 2015 and 2016 he constantly killed and then we when we got the news and then those elites have really uh i i saw their faces like the you know anger and then you know fear they have a two both i mean both anger and fear so i would say they can you know you know against kim regime at any time if conditions are met and I would say um, rather some North Korean citizens are, you know, pure. And then because of the education, some people still believe Kim regime. And then some people still, still blame the elites, like 
because of their lives, they don't they didn't do their job because they didn't do their job we are living poor. But if somebody who realized the system that it's the matter of system, the system that like the failed uh, central, I mean, centralized economy system and then the failed you know, socialist system and the failed dictatorship. So um, yeah, um, like, but I, I would say eventually they will realize the point that um, I mean, the elites or like they, they, are the, they are not the problem. The problem is Kim Jong-un and the system. Okay, thank you so much, Yushin, for that question and Hansi for your uh, in-depth response. We have another hand raised by Noto Suoneto. Um, if you could please unmute yourself and ask your question to Hansen, that would be great. Oh, hi. Um, hi, Hyunsen. How, how are you? Thank you so much for sharing your uh, stories as a North Korean director. Uh, my name is Noto. I'm from Indonesia. Hi, Namsek. Uh, it's a long time to see you and hope you're doing well. And thank you for hosting this event. Um, so, uh, Hyun Sung, I've been working in a foreign policy sector for a few years, and I had experience to visit North Korea or Pyongyang uh, um, three, uh, sorry, three years ago, I guess. And uh, uh, at the time, I met some of uh, North Korean officials. And one conversation that I remember at the time from the high official of North Korea is that the most evil power in the world is, is the United States. And, you know, they, never, they, they will never uh, trust, be trusting the, the South Korean side because uh, the South Korean side is working with the U.S., as simple as that. And it's coming from a very high officials of North Korea. So at that time, I conclude that whatever the South Korean do with the, um, with the North Korea, it's not going to be successful at that time. So I was very pessimistic. And one month after my visit, uh, it, there was a, a first summit of Kim and uh, uh, Tom in Singapore. And I was very surprised because one time the official said that it's a most evil power, but because of maybe so economic pressure and so on and so forth, they uh, eventually met in Singapore. My question is that, oh, sorry. Uh, and it was, the, uh, it was a delegation of Indonesia and Southeast Asia visited North Korea. So my assumption is that, is there any way, and my question to you is that, is there any way that the Indonesian side or the South Korea, uh, uh, East Asian partners can play a role and, and you know, and um, not unifying, but uh, in decreasing the tension between the North Korea and South Korea, because simply they possibly see us as a trusting, as a trusted partner compared to uh, to the South Korean side. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for your question, Nuta. Um, first of all, I think most North Korean officials in North Korea, they cannot say the truth, tell you the truth, or um, they can only blame the U.S. and South Korea. And um, another like question is said how like, you know, the rounding countries can play a role uh, between North and South and North and United States. I would say any, any country can play a role, but the main problem here is Kim Jong-un's intention and his will to negotiate. So, I mean, we have to think about why Kim Jong-un, you know, come to the table to negotiate for what? So in 2018, he came to the table to meet Donald Trump in Singapore because economic sanctions and then another one is military pressure. So if there is no military pressure and economic sanctions, there is no reason he came to the table because he believes, you know, he can maintain regime without any, you know, uh, harm, like, you know, but, but many people questioned about sanction efforts. So I would say there'll never been a real sanction for 20 years, like since US government started. But the real sanctions started like September 2016, the late Obama era, and then Trump continued maximized sanction effort. So, but uh, this, the Singapore summit started and the sanction effort decreased because the overall atmosphere uh, created and then 
South Korean government continually uh, neutralized economic sanctions and then they made a put tons of efforts. So um, due to the, uh, the overall environment, China didn't participate in sanctions. So the sanction really didn't uh, continue from 2018. But what I'm trying to say is if there is no like, you know, pressure, I mean, there is no reason Kim Jong Un come to the table. So even though like, you know, China or you know, Japan can play a role between South and North Korea, but the most important thing is Kim Jong Un's will. So sometimes I did business, sometimes somebody who doesn't want to negotiate or, you know, make a deal. So I just simply change the partner. So that's the easiest deal because, so what I'm trying to convince the US government that why you guys, you know, change the partner, like somebody don't stick with this, uh, somebody who doesn't want to deal. It's uh, easy to place another one who want to deal. But uh, I think it's not easy for US government. So uh, yeah, that's I'm trying to say, but the most important Kim Jong Un's will. All right, thank you so much, Noto, for your question and Hyunsung for that response. Since we are running low on time, uh, we will just have room for one more question um, and it will be, uh, oh, oh, okay, we have a hand raised from Leah Che. Uh, Leah, if you can unmute yourself and ask your question to Hyunsung, that'd be great. Hi, um, first off, my name's Leah from Boston University and I want to thank you for sharing your story. Um, I was just curious on what do you think will be the most powerful medium moving forward or a possible medium in the future to influence North Koreans? So I know you spoke about K-dramas and um, like uh, foreign movies, but what do you think is going to be the most powerful moving forward? Um, thank you for the critical question. I think um, I would say targeted, uh, you know, audience for uh, targeted medium. Um, for example, I mean, I would say South Korean dramas are not effective anymore because, you know, we watched South Korean drama for 20 years, but there's not many changes, only several defectors defected. There's no major change in, South, in North Korea because it, it didn't direct them or it didn't make them to change their society. So I hope that we should send more educational material like documentary film and, you know, um, the simply the system that can compare each other. When they see South Korean system and then they can compare the system with North Korean system. Like for example, uh, I served military and I first saw the US military people, the food and then training. And I was shocked because if North Korean soldiers see that and then they'll be stunned and then they won't fight against the US I mean, military because the food quality they eat and the training they got is, we couldn't imagine that level. And then for example, another like your college life. So I advise a Voice of America to uh, video took a video for, you know, introducing US colleges. So the college life for North Korean students is very important because they wanna know how US students study. They wanna know how US students like apply school or apply, you know, um, uh, uh, courses and other like school life and then after school life. And then they can compare their life with your life and then they will realize their life will be miserable. And then they, I mean, young, I mean, always young people are the you know, main power for the society. So I hope you guys can give many inspirations to North Korean people. All right, thank you so much, Leah, for that question uh, and Hansen for that response. Um, I think we have room for just one more question uh, before we wrap up our Q&A. This is a question that came in through the chat uh, by Risa Perea. Uh, Risa asks, in addition to the services that the South Korean government provides to North Korean defectors like Hanawon and housing services, what is something you think would benefit North Korean defectors adjusting to life in South Korea? 
And this will be the last question. <coughs> Um, I would say, I mean, there's a saying that you shouldn't teach, uh, you shouldn't provide the fish. I mean, you should, I mean, teach them to catch fish, right? So I oppose uh, the South, South Korean governments provides the funding and then, you know, housing because compared to not, uh, the factors in the United States and South Korea, there are more many uh, the factors in the United States, they made a success in their life because, but there's, they, they haven't any uh, help from the government. But when you go to South Korea, there was a like uh, fundamental, I mean, no basic uh, salary or like funding for housing and then um, necessary necessities. So, but if we don't work and then they still get the fund from the government. So some people, they don't work. And then some people, they refuse to get the good jobs because they can still get the money from the government. So I don't think it's very effective and it's a waste of money. And then maybe they have to uh, you know, learn how to make money and how to make their life better. But they shouldn't rely on the government and then uh, and then South Korean government should teach them how to earn money and then more, I would say, emphasize more education on North Korean defectors. All right, thank you so much, Risa, for that question that you posted in the chat and Hyunsung for that response. Uh, we are gonna have to wrap it up there for our Q&A session. I know there were more questions that were asked in the chat box. Um, and there were also questions that are, you know, posted through the registration link. So. I don't know, maybe we're gonna to have to organize another event where you can answer those questions, Hyunsung, but we're gonna to have to wrap it up for there uh, today. Um, so thank you everyone for your thoughtful questions and to Hyunsung for your responses. I think, you know, for me, the fact that we have this group of young people gathered here today, wanting to learn more about the North Korean human rights issue, wanting to figure out how to move forward and take action is really, really awesome. I think. Like the name of today's event, I believe that as Hyunsung took action to create the ripples of change by defecting from North Korea and now sharing his story to the world, all of us here on this Zoom call, we can also create those small ripples by joining these efforts and getting involved. Um, eventually, we want, we want to see these ripples turn into waves where the power of a grassroots movement can determine you know, the future fate of the Korean Peninsula. This concludes our uh, speaker event, A Ripple of Change. I wanna thank you so much, say thank you so much to Hyunsung for volunteering your time to share your testimony with all of us here. I also wanna thank the two core cool organizers, Alliance for Korea United USA and Liberty in North Korea at UCLA for making this event possible. Thank you for the tech team for helping us run this event on Zoom. And lastly, I want to thank you all for coming to join today's event. So please be on the lookout uh, for an email with a link to a post-event survey. And I hope everyone stays healthy. And I wish the best of luck to all the college students for the remainder of spring semester. So good night, everyone.